Oh, hey there. Welcome to the Nerdy About Nature podchat series, where I sit down with folks from different backgrounds and experiences to chat all about things pertaining to nature. My name is Ross, and this podcast is an extension of a passion project I started called Nerdy About Nature, which also includes tons of fun educational videos all over Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and basically everywhere else on the internet. Now, all that I create here serves as a means to inspire, educate, and engage folks with the outdoor world so that we can all become better stewards of it, have a little bit more fun when we're out enjoying it, and work to create a more inclusive, diverse, equitable, and just future for each and every one of us in this world that we all share. Because nature, it sure is pretty neat, and I think we should keep it that way. So come on, let's go get nerdy. Come and take a nature walk with me, we're gonna check out some really cool trees, we're gonna hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can't live without. Let's go get nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby. Nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Come on, let's get nerdy about nature. Ah, well, hello again. What is up, my fellow nerds? Welcome to the podcast. Uh, This week, we've got a pretty special one lined up. I'm really excited for it. We're stepping a bit away from the woods on this one and into the marbled hallways of our parliament building, or rather, the Rose Garden right outside of it, to chat with the leader of the BC Greens party, Miss Sonia Furstenau. Now, Sonia and I have been playing phone tag back and forth for months here, trying to line this one up, but we finally managed to make it happen in between fall storms, and I think you all are really going to enjoy it. Sonia is an incredibly brilliant and well-spoken human with some truly great values and perspectives on the way our current world of politics operates, and I left this conversation fully convinced that the world would be a much better place if we just had more people like her involved, and I think you'll agree with me after listening here regardless of your political affiliation or bias. We covered quite a bit here from her outlook on the world and how that translates into political influence, where we are in protecting ecosystems and biodiversity in the province, the hurdles we face in creating lasting, meaningful change for the wellness of both our planet and our society, and how everyday people like you and I can get involved and help shape that change. So let's get into it and get inspired with Sonia first and now. Thank you so much for joining me. I know we've been trying to make this happen for months now, so glad we finally got the time. It's a dream come true for me. (laughs) I'm such a fan. No, I mean, you you are like, you are making nature not nerdy. You're making it wondrous and exciting. Making nature neat again. Yeah, you're making nature neat again. Yeah. I know. I I always like to think that, like, um, I did a nature walk this morning and yesterday with a couple of people up in Shawnigan, and they're like an older crowd, you know, like probably late 30s, mid 40s. (laughs) And... I mean, like relative to like the people I talk to, you know, <laughs> what I'm getting, I what I'm getting at, at all right now, is Rush. that these are like, you know, professional people from Vancouver who haven't thought about what a tree is since they were in second or third grade, you know, and to see that, that light up again in them is so powerful to see people find that joy at that like wonderment and like, you yeah. know, it's yeah. great. It is great. Yeah. It is. It is what nature is it's the gift that nature can give any day. Um, so you're a bit of a nature fanatic, I, I am. assume. I what, am. Um, yeah, what, tell me about yourself. What got you into politics? What do you appreciate about, yeah, I guess, yeah, what do you appreciate about the outdoor world? Like, what kind of got you into that? And why, of all the things you could be doing in politics, why the BC Greens? <laughs> <laughs> of all of it. Why aren't you full conservative? Oh, <laughs> okay, so... I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to the beginning. So the first time I went to Berg Lake, uh, on Mount Robson, uh, I was two years old. I was in my dad's backpack and throughout childhood, um, we went to the Rockies in the summer and we went to the Rockies in the winter. We skied in the winter, we hiked in the summer. And so When I look back on my early childhood, in particular, my memories are all, you know, sleeping next to a river, um, walking through beautiful alpine um, settings, eating the little chocolate dextrose tablets that my dad would bring, which I thought were such a treat. What are those? In the 70s. Um, They were like little squares of chocolate, but they were pure dextrose. 
And what's a dextrose? The, I don't know what that word is. Kind of a sugar. Oh, and it was like a, for, like a stevia of the time. Yeah, like the stevia of the time. It was like to keep your energy up. But okay. as a as a five year old or seven year old right. going hiking in the in the Rocky Mountains, this was like the treat that I could look right. forward to every year. Was it kind of like the the um, like energy shot? Yeah, like a little energy okay. shot of yeah. the nineteen seventies. Gotcha. Yeah, and uh, and then of course the skiing. And uh, we lived, my, both my parents ended up, they, they got divorced when I was young, but they both ended up living on acreages out, uh, and one hour west and one hour east of Edmonton. I'm like, well, thanks for all the driving parents. Um, and then I moved out here when I was 20 to Victoria. And I had what I consider to be a real life-changing experience. I went out to Carmana and went camping for a few nights with my roommates and realized I'd never been in a forest before. Like a proper like forest. A, like yeah. an ancient forest. Mm. And that experience really changed me in that I felt th- that deep wonder of nature as an adult and um, ended up you know, being involved in, in the work, the on the ground protesting and organizing uh, around Carmana and, and Walbren, the the board rock building that was going on there in the early 90s. Did you partake uh, in the board? I the did building. build some of that boardwalk. Awesome. And uh, may have stood on a, on a road early in the morning and made the news for that uh, when the uh, trucks came along and weren't too happy to have people blocking the roads. <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> um, so that's 32 years ago. Yeah. Um, and that has never changed in me. And uh, now a mother of three and stepmother to two. Um Nature has played a role in their lives. My six, when my 16-year-old was six and we stopped again for another hike in the mountains on a road trip, she said, I wish I'd been born in a family that doesn't like hiking. <laughs> but, but now she, you know, uh, Shawnigan Lake, we go up Mount Baldy. Right. Uh, that's our weekend that's actually, exercise. That's where I did the nature walk this morning. Do you know that when I was area director... Um, I worked with the community to do fundraising and uh, building support and bought that mountain for the CVRD. That was one of my accomplishments as a politician. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, how do you mean bought it? Like, what was... what was? So, it was privately owned yeah. and by developers. Yeah. And there was uh, the hope by those developers at some point that they would build more housing, more houses on Mount Baldy, but it was recognized as a community goal to protect that as a park it is now a cvrd park yeah it's beautiful and uh we we bought it in 20 oh my gosh 15 um and it is fully paid off and that is a permanent cvrd park that's amazing yeah Uh, it's so great to have places like that just a minute few minutes drive from like so many communities i think that's like a huge part and Part of the questions that I guess we'll get to that I had kind of like written down here. Um, But so, yeah, you've been very active in activism and environmental stuff then your whole life, it sounds like. Yeah, it's certainly been a thread throughout my whole life. And the, um, you know, you asked about the BC Green Party. We just had our our celebration of being 40 years old, the BC Greens, which I I understand you consider that to be old, like 30 and (laughs) (laughs) 40-year-olds. But, uh, um, and what was so fascinating, you know, the the origins of the BC Green Party was uh, Adrian Carr trying to get a motion at the BC NDP convention uh, to um, protect old growth. And couldn't get that motion moved through the BC NDP convention. And just 40 years ago. 40 years ago. Wow. 1983. And so uh, she and others decided, okay, we're going to start a political party in BC that is that recognizes the importance of protecting old growth in this province and responding to climate change. And the most amazing thing, she, she had some newspapers from those days that they put out quarterly. And in the middle of one was this big chart. I'm well known for all the charts that I draw of things. Really? I can show you some of my charts. And this chart looked like one of my charts. Like it was like how do we connect, you know, the need to have food security and 
and strong, vibrant communities with the need for action on climate change and right. biodiversity protection. I'm like, wow, we really, like, the BC Greens really are consistent. Yeah. When you say a chart, like, I'm picturing, like, a Charlie from Always Sunny in Philadelphia, like, post-its all over the wall and strings between things, like... I think that it, yeah, I mean, some of my charts are quite pretty. Yeah. Um, and some of them are just a lot of words, but it's, it's, I think the big thing is like those connections. Right. And nature teaches us about connections more than anything. It certainly does. And, um, I think that that is one of the things about the BC Green Party that, um, makes so much sense to me is that we are oriented towards, you know, these, these strong principles, but to recognizing that we can't solve one thing at a time, right? That the the climate emergency is creating a whole bunch of other emergencies. And until we look at solutions that really cut across these silos that really shouldn't exist, um, we're going to continually see governments respond to symptoms as opposed to root causes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess as like a politician like dealing with that because so many of these issues that we deal with today like are siloed and treated as such where it's just like oh we have a healthcare issue or housing crisis or um you know like there's everything is just like easily broken down into like a yes or no vote but how do you work to create change that is like that kind of holistic model that that essentially changes the structure mm -hmm. that we live in because what we that's really what we need is like mm -hmm. structural change like how do you how do you do that well i think what we do is we just continually try to show that that's possible and 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 when I look at some of the work that we've worked on um, Adam's work on the Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that is a kind of a, a structural piece that does start to change how government operates it puts a, a really critical lens and framework onto government operations and I was just in a another panel with a, a group of teachers just now and I I brought up what a Cedar George Parker talks about a lot. He says we have to humanize politics and indigenize our institutions. And that um, here in BC in particular we have this extraordinary uh, gift of indigenous cultures all through the whole province, strong, vibrant, alive culture. And that can be a guidepost for us. We have the leadership here that can help us take an institution like this that does silo the world and, and divides it all up and, and looks at it in ways that have got us to the place we're at. And And we can recognize that it's the coming together of world views of cultures that can actually move us to a place where we are looking at the interconnectedness the as um robin wall kimmerer says the more than human world that we're a part of all the non-human people all the non-human people adam talks about the salmon people and the cedar people I mean, my colleague in the bc greens adam wilson sartlip first nation is the guide i i live and experience this every day in my work to have someone who's who's rooted in his culture willing to be a guide and a teacher and um it's amazing it is it's such a such a privilege to be able to have that opportunity it's it, really cool it really is and i can tell you there's nothing better like when i go to a um an event or a ceremony um an indigenous event and have Adam next to me literally walking me this is what's happening now oh you have to understand oh, okay this is the and and the you know Cowichan tribes is uh is very much that in up in Cowichan Valley and I think it's one of the things that makes Cowichan Valley so special is that connection and integration of Cowichan tribes and non-indigenous community and you know that exists in the couch and watershed board with the co-governance model there it's chaired by the chief of the couch tribes and the chair of cvrd so this is an example of indigenizing our institutions of humanizing our politics and we need more and more of that mm -hmm. 
Hey, that sounds incredible. Almost like a fairy tale, like almost too good to be true. I think for like a lot of people, <clears throat> just like the average average people, like there are a lot of like hindrances that keep them from like, like the idea of like undrip and decolonization and going about that on a daily basis. Like not too many people have strong mentors like that who are able to walk them through ceremonies and things like that. And opportunities to learn are kind of difficult to find for the average person. So my question to you is like, how do we work on like implementing these things at a societal level to where it's not um, a drastic culture shift for those who might not be on board already? Or like, how do we how do we include everybody in a transition that is more human um, without galvanizing, uh, I, don't, I mean, those who tend to be galvanized, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the conservative right, if I can just say it bluntly. So, <laughs> yeah, change provokes fear. And so I think that, um, and, f you know, people can feel afraid of something that, seems different or is is um asking them to look at the world differently but the you know the work of reconciliation is is work for all of us to do and i think it's taking small steps right like um adam's dad has a book club and my my husband is part of that book club and they read books written by indigenous authors and they get together on Sunday nights on zoom and they discuss those books. That's and, awesome. um, so looking for those opportunities in your community, yeah, they exist reaching out to the first nations in your communities and, um, finding those opportunities to be a participant in the work of reconciliation. Um, not being afraid. There's just this extraordinary generosity and kindness and, uh, openness. And, um, you know, even in the time I've lived up in Cowichan for 12 years now and, and not unlike my experience going into Carmana Walbrun, which really changed me at a cellular level, my experience living in Cowichan and, and, having the gift of getting to know Cowichan people, Cowichan leadership to be, I've been in the longhouse, was just there for a funeral a week ago. And every time I, I have that experience of being changed in, in a good way. And so letting go of fear and um, recognizing that we are in this world that is ever changing another lesson from nature right and we can we can participate in that and that makes it so much less frightening yeah no i agree it, it takes like a an openness and a willingness for people to learn but again like it it is scary and i feel like we we live in a scary world in a sense like there are so many people who are just struggling to exist day to day so to throw in something seemingly major to them that like that does threaten them with change that they're maybe not ready for or unwilling to participate in is really scary for a family that's or for someone who's trying to support a young family um, in a crazy housing market um, or maybe has some sort of like social issues like drug abuse like anything it's like it's there are so many challenges to just simply existing these days um, and then especially from like an industry perspective like um, I've seen a lot of things that like me from like a third party outside, outside, um, viewpoint on like th things that are happening. It almost seems like many industries are kind of capitalizing on the idea of UNDRIP as a way to kind of further the status quo of said industry instead of actually like embracing the change that like, that it's trying to accomplish. Like how do we, how do we get industries to change? That's the role of government. The role of government is to insert public interest right into uh, so industry wants to exist here and uh you know make money extract resources government's job is actually to be the buffer that insists that the public interest is being served but in bc we have a long i mean the the 
the whole beginning of government in BC, <laughs> yeah. it it was built to serve the interests of the timber barons and the yeah. coal barons. It's all extraction. It was it, we uh, Adam has been saying this for years now. B BC in its kind of essence is a resource colony, and we have to let go of that that long-standing story of BC and and government needs to be able to uh, shape a new story mm -hmm. that isn't about more extraction that isn't about you know really the ways in which uh, resources and people in this province have been exploited for the benefit of profit making um, those timber barons and coal barons have been replaced by multinational corporations. Shareholders from all over the world. Shareholders that are still yeah. looking to extract as much profit as they can from the lands and the people here. And um, we are totally capable of shaping a different future. And that's, that's what, you know, I, I, when I first got elected at local government, my kids were little. And one of them said, you know, mom, what, what are you doing? What's your job? What do you do when you go to this place? And I said, we shape the future. Every single decision shapes the future that we're going to have. And so we have to be making decisions here uh, and at all levels of government that, that start to shape the future that creates less insecurity for people, that creates um, more connection in our communities that creates a sense that you're not on your own i mean you know we have sort of neoliberalism has created the sense of like you're just on your own nobody's there but security a sense of security is something that we create between each other and between our connection with the natural world so water security food security energy security climate security climate security mm -hmm. and then the the kind of social sense of security that i'm not afraid of of the people in my community in my neighborhood that i i know my neighbors that i'm um participating in actually building a, a healthier stronger community we all um, have a role to play in that emergency planning could actually be a significant part of this if we actually looked at emergency preparation as creating really strong social fabric then we are going to create a far deeper sense of security than we can with have your you know have your secure your emergency bag ready to go and your evacuation plan you're on your own that's a very different feeling than we have a neighborhood captain for our 30 households. We're going to have really good communication. We're going to have built the relationships in our little pod. And this is happening in lots of parts of BC. We're going to know who's got the generators, who's got the wood stoves, who's got Love the skills. Idea. Yeah. And then we're going to, we're going to level that up. Once we've done the emergency preparation, we're going to level it up into real social resiliency. Oh, look, it's like six of us go to the same destination every day. We're going to start carpooling and you've got grandparents at home and we've got young kids we're going to start you know looking at how elders and and children can be you know part of a, a whole system of care and and then we're actually creating the conditions that when emergencies happen because they're going to keep happening we know that we have the people around us that we can count on and that is a sense of real security that's beautiful. I've never really thought about it like that. I have a chart. <laughs> yeah. I'm not just saying. I'll show you yeah, my chart. Yeah, I would love to see that. I mean, because it's it's so true. Like, you look at any anything that's happened recently, like any of the fires, and, like, it's all stories about people escaping as, like, individuals. Like, there's not really that community sense. And then, and then so often blame gets put on the government for, quote, failing to meet certain needs in an emergency, which for sure there are certain needs that need to be met. But I think if people had that security sense with those that they surround themselves with, it'd be a lot better, a lot easier. 
And the reason I, I started thinking about this, I, I made the chart in 2019 after we were on a road trip and got turned back because a wildfire was moving very quickly and we were in a 100-mile house. We actually had to go through Vail Mount to come home. Oh, God. Um, That's a drive. And it was, uh, you know, and it, re- it, was, it really hit home. You know, these emergencies are going to keep coming. So I, I, there were two things in my mind. One, in emergencies, people rise to their best selves. Oh, my gosh. We are extraordinary. Our humanity comes out in emergencies. And even the fires this summer, yep, people had to flee the Okanagan uh, West Kelowna and Kelowna and, and, you know, they felt like they're on their own, but immediately communities all over opened their doors and said, you can come stay with us. We're going to billet you. We're going to put you up, um, as far as the Kootenays, um, you know, and so you saw what I think is the essence of our humanity is that we are kind of oriented towards care for each other. So when I, got back from that road trip I thought how do we how do we capture that care that we we all have in us and that we feel so good about when we're able to to express and and lean in how do we turn that into something that actually creates that that deeper social fabric and so I made a chart it's my neighborhood captain's chart (laughs) I love it um, just backstepping a little bit here, because like what you're touching on is like all very relevant. It's all very true. Like humans have this innate um, ability and like desire to like care for one another. Um, and I mean, even that is like a very human to human thing. I think beyond that, once you are, you know, like certain people have more of a an innate desire to care for beyond just the humans and the people that we, the people in the places, the non-human people that we all live amongst. Um, So that's a very real human desire, human need. You said it earlier, government's role is to like take the needs of the people and like, like implement that into law so that like society is structured in a way that meets those needs. Do you feel that government now is doing a good job of doing that? No. And I think we've, you know, we've been in, in a different story for a while. And I, I, um, I was 10 years old in 1980, and I was at the A&W drive-in with my best friend Candace and her mom, Nora, and the news came up that Ronald Reagan had been elected as president in the United States, and Nora, who had a dog named Che, so that probably (laughs) shorthand, uh, gives you a lot of information about Nora. And she's 10 too? No, Candace was 10, Nora was Candace's mom. Oh, okay. Okay, Nora, and I remember this so vividly, was like... Oh, this is this is such a terrible turning point. And you know, we saw in the 1980s this movement towards neoliberalism, towards the this story of separateness. Margaret Thatcher saying there's no such thing as society. Um and uh you know, movies at the time that came out, like greed is good, right? And this story that you're on your own, you're separate from everybody else, and then government policies decade over decade that really uh, undermined the the social safety net, undermined the investments into public institutions like uh, public education, uh, post-secondary education, uh, into really protecting public health care. Um, and so now here we are, and it's, you know, 43 years since that night in uh, November. And we are now seeing that this story of separateness and the story of you're on your own is not working. And people feel so much insecurity and are, you know, really suffering because that social safety net Mm -hmm. has turned into a high wire. And I feel like that feeds a lot into people's fear of change because there is so much uncertainty with a lot of the things that we're, we as a society are talking about, and especially a party like the Green Party is putting forward because they are 
somewhat radical to like the way that um, civilization, quote unquote, <laughs> if we're just going to be civilized, has existed on this continent for the past like hundred years or so. Um, it, it is like a scary time for a lot of these people, a lot of people in general to just be thinking about how to do things different when we can barely get by as is. And especially like compounded with that sense of um, that individuality, that neoliberalism, neoliberalism that you're talking about, like it's been drilled into us that it's like, you know, um, every man to their own, like you versus the world. Like these are like common themes in like music and pop culture that like have been instilled in like even myself and like through the nineties and stuff like it's, that's kind of like the world that we will have all been raised in. So to try to radically shift that to one that embraces community and embraces um, that kind of like long-term thinking that's beyond just the four year election cycle, at least in the States, you know, like it's, I feel like that's a really difficult thing to do to get people to focus on. It is really difficult. And, um, you know, we, we are starting to get storytelling that is, is giving us a different way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And, um, Ted Lasso is a great example of this. Not only does, um, uh, Suzanne Samard's book keep showing up in Ted Lasso, which I love, um, but the whole story is about, you know, if we just focus on creating a strong fabric rooted in care and love between ourselves, then we become something so much greater than ourselves. And, and I think that, you know, it's going to take a while for us to, to really be able to tell these new stories in a way that... Um, start to shift, but but look at the popularity of that show, right? As an example, and I think that you know it's up to people like me to tell a different story in that building, and to really insist on on you know not accepting the myth of you know what really drives our economy because it certainly isn't resource extraction. We subsidize resource extraction in this province. We subsidize it. It couldn't be economically viable if it weren't for the people of British Columbia paying for it. And we pay for it not just in in subsidies and and tax dollars that way. We pay for it in the landslides because that happen because of clear cuts. We pay for it in the atmospheric rivers being driven by climate change. We pay for it in the destruction to Wedzinkwa up in Wet'suwet'en territory. Um, an absolutely pristine river that Adam and I had the absolute gift of going down in rafts last summer, dipping our water bottles in, drinking this amazing water. And Chief Namak said, when that water is in you, it changes you. And it did. It's, again, these moments that, that have changed me. And then to see the destruction that happened because of the building of the coastal gas link pipeline, And to see a government that really hasn't done its job of putting the public interest in between the interests of industry and the people of BC. And so we need people, and I was just again on this panel with teachers, democracy is a high participation activity. And um, we need the participation of, of everybody to make it really work. And um, people need to see themselves as part of that fabric as well. You can shape the decisions that people are making. You can choose to invest in the story of, of us being connected and together. And we absolutely can solve the problems that we're facing right now. And one of the, one of the ways we do it is we start to say, there's got to be a ceiling, not just a floor to wealth. Our floor gets lower and lower as the ceiling gets higher. We have, you know, 10 years ago, the wealthiest people on this planet had tens of billions of dollars. And now they have hundreds of billions. Billions, yes. That ceiling, as it has gone up, means that the floor keeps going down. Yeah, and I guess that, like, gets to, like my question of like disen like so many people i feel like nowadays are disenfranchised with the idea of being able to make positive change in government because 
that ceiling has like gotten so much higher but those people at the top hold so much power over our government institutions like you know things like every vote counts and like use your voice and stand up i mean we can see that happening with fairy creek like so many people came out of the woodwork to protest this thing that like that meant a lot to them 30 years after it had already been protest with war in the woods and in that time what 30 percent of old growth logging has continued to happen like our, our old growth forest has been lost and even then we got the government to reluctantly commit to making changes that still haven't happened three years later and so it's like what <laughs> like what's the point like how do we how do we create a system where we can actually where we can give equal weight to the individual voice as the billionaire, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Th that has to happen. I mean, we need structural change in here because right. the lobbyists have moved in, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, how do we kick them out? Like but but <laughs> I, I want to go to the, you know, yes, it's frustrating how much isn't happening at the speed that it should be happening but had it not been for the war in the woods had it not been for the boardwalk building in Carmana and Walbrand had it not been for the people at Ferry Creek the outcomes would have been much worse and so it's really hard to celebrate the victories when they're so small and so far between but also recognize that without all those voices and all those people um, those giants, those ancient trees would have come down um, and there would probably be nothing left. And so we have to recognize, you know, it's frustrating and it's imperfect and it's still essential. In the reason I'm in politics, you know, a, a contaminated landfill permit Five million tons of contaminated soil above Shawnigan Lake. 12,000 people get their drinking water from that lake. I, I couldn't believe any government would even consider that for a second. It was such a trust-breaking experience for me. And, you know, after four years of working as a community, working collectively, building literally building community was the way that we fought back against that permit and uh coming out and get that permit got revoked first time in bc's history um my intention in coming here was i want to i want that trust to come back i i was so devastated to lose that sense of trust in government um and i know that so many people feel this way I'm so committed to, like, we have to make trust absolutely central. So when a government says, oh, yeah, um, we'll get the old growth strategic review, and then it comes out with the 14 recommendations, and then they begrudgingly accept that they're going to do the 14 recommendations, and then they kind of don't, and then there's, like, it, it feels, you know, like every victory has been one step forward, half a step back, or three quarters of a step back, but it's still, it's still moving us in the right direction. And that's two people in this legislature that for five years would not stop bringing up old growth forests. And that's all the people outside the legislature who would not stop standing up for old growth forests. And those forces together did create outcomes and and it's you know the the sad reality is is they're so hard fought these wins and they're so easy to lose but we can't give up because it's hard because it's so essential these forests are like they are gems of this planet mm -hmm. they are the most precious thing that we have to protect yeah, and not just for, I mean, I don't need to reiterate it to my audience because <laughs> I'm sure they're already like tuned into forest stuff. But I mean, it's like, yeah, forests are beautiful, but then the ecological function they serve from a climate perspective, from a community perspective, like all the different values that they hold. Um, and and in my in my ideal world, you know, like this is where I see the power of industry. It was Adam waving. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, are we getting kicked out? No, I have you here. I, we're not getting kicked no, out of anywhere. No, there's no kicking out. Um, no, I, I, I have privilege. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> just rope off this rose garden. That's right. Um, in an ideal world, like I see, you know, a place where the logging industry with direction from the right people in, in the industry, um, like specialists have the ability to, to shift around those subsidy dollars and actually work to create a system that is beneficial to like the average person working like so we can create more jobs for fallers, more biology jobs, like all this stuff like to create like healthy management of forests, which has never been the case because industry has always kind of capitalized on deciding what the bottom line is. Like even with getting um, the phrasing removed from the forest practices code about uh um, any like not logging because it have, may unduly affect. Yes. Like that's Th- great to that's get that great. removed, but we still haven't affected yeah. the annual allowable cut. Like we still haven't made those changes. So I guess like uh, from an individual um, citizen, like what can we do? Like do, do the calls actually work? Do the letters work? They like d- the, it is. It is that slow and steady pressure. And yes, it does work. And please don't stop because it helps. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> a child just <laughs> fell on the concrete. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> is he going to be okay? <laughs> that age. Yeah. Um, everything hurts. Um, it the is constant pressure. It, I, I, and I've, I've, you know, I know other people talk about activism this way is it's no, 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 no. And then suddenly it's yes. Right. And you never know if it's one more letter or one more rally or one more, green MLA that that is going to like get us to the place that we need to be um but those voices are so important and it is really essential that we have people that are willing to continue to stand up for trees can't speak right they they can't they need us those forests and um you know your point about climate it I, I heard Suzanne Smart speak uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago, and she talked about the the capacity for old growth forest to sequester carbon. And I and think a lot of people it. think that it's in the tree. It's not yeah. in the tree. It's in the soil. And you know it because when you walk in an old growth forest, it's like walking on a, on a trampoline. It's so <laughs> soft, and mm-hmm. there's so much beneath you that's just absorbing your weight and it's so forgiving and and it's amazing and then you go into um, a second growth forest and the ground's quite a bit harder there isn't that softness and then into a third growth plantation and there's no life and it's that it's that life in the soil that we can't see Um, I thought you know one thing for education that we could be doing is in the BC Museum. Imagine if it was like you're going to walk through thousands of years of of the the growth of an ancient forest, and you know, let's start at the end of the Ice Age and then move through what that forest, and then we're going to go underground, and you're going to walk into what's beneath an ancient forest and i think if we if we put that as a treasure that that existence of uh you know i'm not going with you know you put a tree in the tree museum but you actually use the museum to show that the treasures in bc are also natural treasures and that an ancient forest is is the most precious treasure we have and you imagine what it would be like to be able to walk into and and look and see that extraordinary life that exists underneath the forest floor. You're, you were a teacher before this, right? I was were a you? teacher. You're such a teacher. It's so great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Arts and crafts with it, like throwing in some, some education, some cultural appreciation into that. It's a great exhibit. Yeah. Love it. It would be so neat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think like building that connection and and getting people to understand that and again like like healthy ecosystems like we're we're talking about forests but like healthy ecosystems of all types play roles throughout the various ecosystems we have uh throughout British Columbia from grasslands in the Kelowna area the high plateau to wetlands and bogs um all the stuff that we kind of take for granted and have typically used as like development land for like oh just like dam the bog fill it in and put a parking lot there maybe an IKEA you know like 
that's kind of like the way that we've treated these ecosystems. Um, is there much happening in the legislature or anything like going around like uh, natural natural capital, like building resilience in our ecosystems to prevent, you know, flooding at the seawall and, and like creating healthy floodplains for rivers so they don't flood? Like, I'd say most of that work is happening outside of the provincial government. It's happening in local communities, at local government level, and at First Nation level. So a few examples, um, Gibsons um, brought in natural asset management and so put a value on their natural assets and value the services that they provide. So an intact forest, an intact watershed provides extraordinary services. If you think about what would it cost us to have to find and treat water that we get right out of a watershed perfectly ready to go, right? So um, we see that kind of leadership from Gibsons um, in uh, other regions looking at Indigenous-led um, restoration projects that take into account, you know, how a river or a floodplain have historically existed and, and how to get us back to that kind of place. Again, Cowichan with the Cowichan Watershed Board, really centering the Cowichan River as a, as like the the heart and the the veins of our mm-hmm. whole region. Um, it's and almost for like salmon, the salmon, pro- right? They're, and that's for kind of salmon, a, a big thing that they're focusing on. Yep, we um, one of the things in Cowichan is is to get the weir on on Lake Cowichan raised so that there can be enough water held back in times of real drought to keep the river um, able to sustain salmon. We've had water being pumped over that weir this summer. Um, and literally the river and the salmon are on life support. And those salmon, of course, are connected to the health of the orca, right? Um, to the health of the whole ecosystem. And salmon jobs and communities. Jobs like, and communities, like everything. And, and again, you know, from, from Adam's yeah. perspective and the way that he talks about salmon, you know, we're salmon people, he says. We're salmon people the salmon is in the DNA of the people here. Um, It's in the DNA of the forest. It's in the DNA of the bears. It's in the DNA of the orcas, right? And um, we can't be passive about the threats to salmon. We can't be passive about the fact that on our watch, um, the spotted owl looks to be going extinct in B.C., and we have a government that lobbied the federal government not to put habitat protection order in place. Yeah. To, uh, you know, what to accept that, that spotted owl habitat can be habitat where uh, it's been clear cut and in 20 years from now there might be a forest there or where firing ranges are allowed to happen. Like, we can't c- try to mental gymnastics our way around the fact that the reason spotted owls have gone extinct in BC is because they have nowhere to live. Yeah. Do you know more, like, why did the federal government shoot that down? Like, was there a reason given? Like, um, well, I do know that this government, yeah. um, lobbied the federal government not to put an emergency protection order in place. BC government. Did. Yeah. There's a, Sarah Cox has done some fantastic investigative reporter From reporting the in the Narwhal. Right. So you can look up Sarah Cox's articles on the actual briefing note that went to Minister Cullen, um, arguing that the protection orders for ha- spotted owl habitat would have um, a socioeconomic impact on industry. Which is another way of saying it would have unduly affected timber supply. Yes. And so I think our question is, at what point do we say, um, instead of a limit on how much nature we're going to have left, we're going to put a limit on how much profit can be extracted from the natural world here. Well, and, and that's the a thing too, like you talked a bit at the beginning about like going out to like glacier and, and seeing all these places, like the idea of shifting baselines over time. Um, I think there's like an economic baseline that people are accustomed to as well. And this idea that we've always kind of pursued 
endless growth where it's like your bottom line gets bigger every every year so to um theoretically stop that bottom line from getting bigger and maybe even reduce it in some like short-term sectors so that we can like work towards restoration efforts to like create stronger healthier resilient ecosystems and thus natural resources to continue operating our communities and industries on um people resist that at all costs because it again it, it affects their quarterly returns because we're again so focused on short-term metrics it's mm-hmm. so, like how do we get i feel like i know how you're gonna answer this <laughs> but how do we how do we promote p- create that long-term change you know so it's yeah. like where we can put something in place that is going to last for 20 years and we don't have to worry about the next administration just kicking it out yeah. if they get in. It, it, our economic system, we invented these systems. Yeah. Capitalism is an invention, right? It's not a natural thing. Um, it's, it's a system that we invented. And right now, it's really failing a lot of people and it's failing our natural world. And so let's look at ways that we ensure that our economy, what we're measuring from our economy, we've been talking about this for years now. Um, There are governments around the world that are bringing in well-being measures. Even federally, we have a quality of life index that is used to look at budgeting and and measuring the economy. Um, But if we are only measuring the economy through GDP, right, Uh, gross domestic product, then of course, it has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the only way that we say this economy is successful. But if we're measuring the economy in terms of health outcomes, in terms of um, the natural world outcomes, in terms of um, how many people are housed, in terms of how many people have a sense of community, all of this is exists in um, places like um, Scotland, New Zealand, where they're, they are using well-being indexes to look at the, the success of the government's budget and the economy. And so, w- number one, change the story, right? Is, is a relentless growth economy serving us very well? Um, I would say that a lot of people probably don't feel very well served by the economy right now. And so how do we, as humans, how, how do we insist that this system that we've created, <laughs> right? it's, not, it's, not, it's not some sort of invisible hand or force of God, it's a system that we created, we can adjust it so that it is serving the purposes that we want it to serve. And again, I come back to the ceiling problem. I don't think uh, we need people with hundreds of billions of dollars, you won the game. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, Here's your trophy. And now it's time for us to reinsert all of that wealth so that everybody can, can benefit from this wealth that is, you know, either extracted from the natural world or the human world. And, um, I, I, again, like we're, we shouldn't be limited. And I, I come back, of course, it's hard to imagine things that are different than how they exist right now. But we have to. It's an imperative. We absolutely have to. And if we center well-being, collective well-being, um, and we look at communities that um, are really thriving, and we say, okay, how do we create those conditions? How do we invest in those outcomes? And how do we help to recognize that, um, you know, a a, a kind of consumer culture is going to leave us endlessly hungry, Mm. right? We're never going to be full. Um, If you're always looking for the next thing. But that a culture that that centers um, connection and joy and nature and family and community and all these things, how do we, just like we need to value our natural world and, and the services that that natural, what are the services that come to us when we have connected communities? What is the service that comes to us from a well-resourced public education system? Like, how do we value those services because they're enormous we can look at mental health outcomes health outcomes um just happiness yeah joy connection 
Yeah, and there are things that like they just they don't fit in the framework because it's like if no one's making money off of it, like capitalism sh- for sure could be used in a much better way to do good with it. The problem is that you get people who get hyper focused on the greed element, and then it becomes again that neoliberalism. Everybody's trying to outdo each other, um, compete with the Joneses. You know, like how do we? God, how do we just create? <laughs> How do we get (laughs) more people like you involved? How do we get more of that shifted? Because it's like, if if we're always being swayed by the people with money, we don't have an opportunity to look out for the longevity of the individual. And it would be so much easier. There'd be so much less conflict. You know, like so often in politics and things, like the conflict comes down to like an industry of sorts swaying. a decision or laws or something in the way that goes against public opinion that like that keeps the disenfranchised or the oppressed continues to oppress and disenfranchise them and then there's this conflict because then you get social movements and people standing up for it mm-hmm. but if you were just genuinely looking out for the well-being of the people you wouldn't have that conflict no it and, seems like and such an easier way to do it and the fascinating thing about like the the where, where things are at right now is is that that sense of insecurity is is throughout the whole system like people who are who don't have enough feel insecure but even people who have a lot feel insecure um because when we when we aren't looking at collective well-being then and and you you know you're in a system that kind of continually tells you you're on your own right pack your emergency bag and try not to die um then you're imbued with that sense of insecurity. But when you connect with your uh, community around you, when you build those, that social fabric, when you feel like there are people that are, that are there with you, you start to build more of a sense of security. So I think that, you know, I know I keep saying this, but, but we can tell different stories and stories are very powerful. Um, we, we sort of exist in this world based on the stories we tell about it. And um, there are a lot of fantastic storytellers right now who are offering us very different stories and who are showing us that, uh, I think of George Monbiot as one of them. He loves to tell stories about little neighborhoods in England who have kind of... Um, move to this next level of connection and and community care and how wonderfully it's benefiting the people who live there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is just changing the narrative. And I think like to create that long-term change, we just need people invested in that long-term narrative and recognizing that it's not going to be, it's like change what little things you can at the time and then just keep at it, keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and never underestimate that, uh, that one person can can really contribute to big change, right? It's it's all of us, and so uh, one of the things I've really been enjoying is uh, kind of conversations or discourse around the importance of talking to strangers, and that um, the joy of just interacting with somebody you don't know when you're throughout your day. And we lost that in COVID when we were all isolated. Um, leaning back into like that, just that joy of connecting with somebody just for a small amount of time. And, and how about like, what's your opinion, like connecting with people who you wouldn't normally connect with or, or see eye to eye on everything for me. I feel like, especially since COVID and the whole social media world, like it's not only is it so divisive, but it's also very alienating where it's like, you know, you say one thing wrong, people unfollow and they exile you and then like never again. And then, and then everything else you say doesn't matter because of the one thing that you said that didn't appeal. And so it's like, how do we get people to like see through the short term kind of like, um, bubble that's created there and get to like, be like, okay, like we agree with 90% of this stuff and disagree on 10% of this stuff, but I'm going to still continue to talk to you and like have you and recognize you as part of my community, even though we don't agree on these few little things. It's like, we have to be able to build community, you know, like we all shop at the same grocery stores. We all go out and eat at the same restaurants and like, we're all part of this thing together. So trying to ignore someone because of some difference you have between them doesn't help anybody. 
How do we foster that and create that willingness for people to engage in the discomfort of having a difficult and awkward conversation sometimes? Yeah, and I, I do think social media has a big part in this, in that, you know, the the fact that you're you can be anonymous um, or that you can you know cancel somebody or 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 attack somebody and it it's not the in in when we're in community when we're with other people we're, we're all holding each other accountable right and there's uh just social kind of norms that we have that uh, make it much harder to to kind of be that divisive um kind of person when you're in person it's a lot right. harder to be mean <laughs> right yeah. to somebody's face yeah. right and and when you see the impact you're having on the person yeah again i come back to our humanity nobody well not nobody but i would say the vast majority of people don't like causing harm right. or pain to somebody else whether it's especially when they can see it if it's out of sight when, out of mind it's you no, know yeah. And and I think that uh, it is those in-person interactions that can help us reset to that place of, of who we really are. Um, you know, there's some interesting things unfolding in the legislature right now with a, a new political party. Care to talk about it? Well, um, <laughs> it, it's uh, speaking of social media, you know, really amplifying kind of divisive sort of culture wars discourse and bringing that into the BC legislature in question period and in statements. And it's, it's had a very interesting effect in that um, it's actually pulled most of us closer together. And, um, you know, we are kind of holding each other to account in there. And um, the kind of, discourse that the conservatives want to engage in um, is getting collective pushback from the other three parties. And we're, we're saying like, we don't, we do not, we are leaders, we're representatives in here. And we have to insist on respecting the institution, respecting each other, respecting our communities, and not succumbing to um, deepening divides we have to find ways that exactly what you said, we might agree on 90% of things. That 10% can be something that, that we wrestle with, but it doesn't mean that you're less of a person or that I, I reject you because of, of a difference like that. And, um, you know, politics, as we've seen in the United States, has become an incredibly divisive force. And it has stalled. It has basically ground to a halt in so many ways the work that government should be doing on behalf of its citizens. And it, it, that is very worrisome for democracy. It's worrisome for representation. It's worrisome for the, the big hard work we have to do on all these challenges. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm at the other end. I'm like, we can work together on that. Let's collaborate. Let's find a way to work across party lines. Let's find. And um, I'm going to just continue to insist on that. And um, I, I'm, i since I got in here, I guess it's been six years, um, I wake up expecting the best from people every day. Mm -hmm. And then if they disappoint me, I'll wake up the next day and expect <laughs> the best from them. Yeah. Like I'll just reset. It's Buddhism right? 101 um, every day. And, uh, and one of the things I'm really grateful for is, is since uh, David Eby became premier, um, he and I meet regularly and have really honest, just really direct conversations. And I'm really grateful um, that he's demonstrating uh, through his leadership um, an openness to a more collaborative approach in there because we are going to serve the very best when all the voices and all the ideas are at the table. Imagine this. Imagine if we approached provincial politics as uh, with regional caucuses. So there was like a southern Vancouver Island caucus, a northern Vancouver Island uh, 
you know, a Northwest caucus, a Northeast caucus. And those caucuses across party lines work together about, okay, here, what are the issues in our region that, that are really, we need the government to do better on, the government as a machine, right? And then those caucuses were actually collaborating in here. When we came here in the sessions, those caucuses were coming together and then they were uh, bringing forward the solutions and ideas from their region. And suddenly you've got a truly kind of collaborative structure inside the legislature. And you've broken down some of these barriers that these yeah. that exist that really undermine our ability to work right. in the best ways. Especially between party lines and yeah. stuff. And and in America it's different. Like the two party system I think is just so flawed because they're basically it's like sports teams yeah. and it doesn't come down to individual issues. Whereas like here you have, you know, multiple different parties that can kind of prioritize the issues then weigh in different values. Mm-hmm. What what is stopping um, like why is there like can we shift little bits of the system to create those caucuses uh, you're talking sure. about? Like, well, I mean, we can do anything we want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you know, um, you can do it in an informal it. way. Yeah. You could do it in a formal way where you could, uh, y- you know, create l- longer lasting structures. Um, and we have to some degree, like there's committee work that includes all the parties. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, if we want to look at, embracing more of a collaborative and and consensus building approach to governance one of the ways is set tables that include people from different parties and you know we had three and a half years of a minority government where that table had to exist between us and the ndp and i think there was a high level of satisfaction with the government over those years like people felt like oh, okay you know I can see what they're doing. We had the confidence and supply agreement. It was front-facing. People could hold government to account. They could hold um, both of the parties to account. And then we went back. We just reverted back to the standard sort of majoritarian. But there's nothing that prevents any government from saying, actually, we're going to set tables that include, you know, in New Zealand, the Labour government won a majority and still put Greens in cabinet. Mm-hmm. That's, right? Yeah. So it, there's there's nothing that, except that s- stories we tell and our imagination that limits us from being able to to look at the times we're in and say, oof, these are serious times. And so they're time for a more serious level of governance. And to get to that more serious level, we're, we're going to create those structures that can actually be here as, as real grownups, as real adults in right. the room. In in a true democracy, yeah, like, it, really, that's like true democracy. It would be, like, you think about like making true, de- true democratic decisions in whatever it is that you're doing. It it always involves like the best way to do it is having multiple or all the different stakeholders involved in that conversation. I think like when we think about, especially um, in the states, like you hear like oh, democracy's broken and all this stuff. It's like democracy as it started on this continent has always kind of excluded certain voices that wasn't a true democracy. It was like a quote unquote democratic decision between like the white wealthy landowners who like were settlers on this land. And then the more you start to include different stakeholder voices, all of a sudden it becomes more difficult, becomes more, more change, more fear. So it's like being able to include those stakeholders is a huge part of making any decision. And we should always be trying Mm -hmm. to aim for that. That's how we make the best decisions. Um, I realize we're kind of running a little bit long on time here. I I I feel like we've already kind of worked it in, but uh, I just want to ask you one more time: like, what do you think is the biggest hurdle we face in politics these days to creating lasting change, and what it, can we do about it? I think uh, the biggest hurdle is is time frames, really. So we need to be making decisions that are shaping the future and that are really looking to. How do we get from where we are right now to where we need to be, which is like long term vision long term so we need a healthy natural world, we need healthy people, we need healthy communities. so how do we make those long long term um, investments, policies, and laws that that get us to that place? but because we're on a four year election cycle and because we are in this competitive environment where every political party is trying to carve out, you know, its little space or its issue or its its wedge. Um, we end up spending so much of our time focused on um, things that are, 
you know, kind of symptoms of these bigger problems right now, but we're not trying to, we're not getting to the work of solving the root problems. So it's, it's, I, I really do think and believe that it, it is what Cedar George Parker said. It's humanize, humanize the politics, indigenize the the decision making indigenize the institutions indigenize how um how we make decisions and adam explained to me the seven seven generations it's three back and three forward you consider the teachings and the wisdom of your ancestors and then you're that fourth generation right now and then you think three generations ahead so that's decision making that i think is what we need to orient ourselves to what does the past teach us what have we learned i'm a historian so i'm big on that and how do we apply that learning so that we're shaping a beautiful healthy Mm -hmm. fair secure future for everybody yeah i love that it's great um thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me here um i don't know if you did you get my my note about the nonprofit thing? Yeah, who would you like to give this week's donation to? The Mother Tree Project. The Mother Tree Project, <laughs> fitting, love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can definitely do that. Uh, it, for people who might not know what it is, what is the Mother Tree Project? So Suzanne Samarin wrote the book The Mother Tree, and she her research, uh, a really extraordinary research that shows that trees actually take care of each other, communicate through fungal networks under the ground. Um, and the Mother Tree Project is really about protecting these ancient trees and, and forests that are so essential. Yeah. And continuing to do, I think it's a lot of research too, like mm-hmm. continuing to further that stuff, that understanding. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me here. It's been great. Um, love to hear that your insight into making some positive change. It gives me, gives me hope. Good. Feeling optimistic. That's great. <laughs> yeah. It's a four letter word that I really like. Hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of four letter words out there and that's a pretty good one. <laughs> Thanks so much. What a, what a treat. Ooh-wee. Politics may be a messy, complicated and stressful world, but it gives me hope knowing that there are good folks like Sonia and her team hard at work to make changes happen in that big old silly colonial house. So huge thanks again to her for taking the time to chat. You can learn more about the BC Green Party at bcgreens.ca where you can get involved and even join the party. For every podcast episode, I make a donation to a nonprofit or cause of my guest choice. Thanks to support from all my lovely Patreon supporters. And this week, Sonia chose to give hers to the Mother Tree Project, which you can, again, learn more about and check out their website uh, via the links in my show notes. So if you're enjoying this podcast and all the fun educational videos I make all over social media, you can help support their production by becoming a Patreon supporter for as little as a dollar a month or more at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature or by making a one-time donation or getting some sweet merch at nerdyaboutnature.com. All of this support goes into giving us the stability to continue putting time, energy, resources, and research into all these various topics and subjects to continue making content that aims to educate, inspire, and shape a new future for tomorrow. So if you're enjoying it, then we'd really appreciate your support so we can keep on doing it. Either way, I'm absolutely stoked that you're all here engaging and learning to help create a more holistic and connected world in the future. So thank you so much for tuning into this episode, and I'll catch you all next time. Cheers. This episode of the Nerdy About Nature podchat series was produced by me, Ross Reed, and made possible with support from individuals like yourself. For ways to support this project and to learn more, check out nerdyaboutnature.com or at nerdyaboutnature on your favorite social platform.